welcome to the awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listing's photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. You're listening to episode number 35 of the awesomers.com podcast. And this is a secret, everybody. If you want to find show notes and details, just go to awesomers.com slash 35. That's awesomers.com backslash 35. And you'll find any little notes and details. Uh, sometimes we add in links to, to books or other things we talk about. And it's a great way for you to stay informed. Now, today my guest is Carl Cronenberger. And Carl is an indispensable resource and trusted advisor to his clients on issues related to internet law, media, and technology. A seasoned litigator, Carl has tried more than 20 jury trials and many more bench trials, and he regularly handles complex internet law issues, such as internet trademark and copyright infringement, spam litigation defense, internet defamation and false advertising, cyber squatting, FTC lawsuits, data breaches, website agreements, and even privacy disputes. Carl thrives on litigating matters where the legal terrain is uncharted, as is often the case in the realm of internet disputes. As a former general counsel to technology and non-technology companies alike, he has handled many of the day-to-day -day legal issues these companies face, including intellectual property issues, licensing and distribution agreements, and domain disputes. Additionally, he handles a variety of transactions and business disputes for services, technology, and media companies. Carl's even a former prosecutor and an Army JAG Corps officer, and he's both aggressive and creative in solving problems, and he always maintains the highest level of ethical standards. Carl and his team are so awesome. I have definitely worked with uh, Carl himself and, and various members of the firm over the course of many, many years, probably getting close to 15 years um, and that over that time we've done very complex litigation and uh, many of the things I've already mentioned like cyber squatting and intellectual property and trademark management and so on you know I, I'm a big believer in having experts in your corner and Carl's definitely one of the best in this category and one of the very first kind of internet law specialists and this is why we have such a good time I know you're going to enjoy and love today's episode Welcome back, Awesomers. It's Steve Simonson, and uh, today my special guest is Carl Cronenberger. Uh, Carl, how are you, buddy? I'm doing great. Good morning to you. It's very good morning to you. So Carl and I, we go way back, and as you heard from the introduction, he's a super qualified uh, specialist, and his firm handles all kinds of uh, really important things for e-commerce sellers out there. And uh, so Carl, maybe just for, you can supplement the, the bio that I've already read in, uh, just tell people kind of what you do today and, and kind of what takes up your time, what, what you're committed to uh, doing day to day. Sure. Well, I, I'm sitting here in San Francisco. That's where our firm is based. And we are a five attorney boutique firm. All we handle is internet and tech matters. Uh, and for, for years, we've handled all different types of e-commerce matters. And we did get involved with some Amazon matters a good number of years ago shortly after the launch, launch of the marketplace. And it was just so tiny back, um, back then. But it's grown and we're doing a lot more. Uh, and it's sort of shocking the, the amount of work that we're doing these days for people that are um, uh, selling on Amazon or other marketplaces or, or generally e-commerce. But Amazon is just this incredible uh, explosion, um, not just generally, but for our practice. So. Um, uh, it's been a big focus of mine um, for the last couple of years, and we've spoken many times about all different 
issues, problems, and scenarios. So that's a big focus of ours. And of course, we do other type of work as well. We're, we do a lot of just general IP work, all for internet tech-related companies, copyrights and trademarks, and a lot of trade secrets. Just dealing with um, things that come up for a lot of our clients um, in this realm of new media, interactive media. Uh, we also do a lot of work for um, people in the affiliate marketing space, so advertisers, ad networks, and publishers, and that sort of dovetails a little bit with e-commerce um, uh, sellers from time to time. And, um, and, we, and lastly, there's a good amount of FTC defense work. And that's, that's a big thing for me. I, I represent companies against the uh, FTC in court. I have testified as an, as an expert on FTC matters, um, which, by the way, I've testified as, as an expert on Amazon matters, particularly IP issues within the Amazon marketplace. Um, and the FTC and that Amazon experience sometimes come together. But that is a big area of mine as well, FTC defense. And you'll hear that from time to time in a lot of my comments. So yeah, that's, I think, that, oh, go ahead. Steve. I just wanted to jump in because I think a lot of people underestimate some of the FTC reach that exists online. Uh, so often people are just posting this or that, or they're, you know, hey, this is a great company, or you know, they, they make all kinds of what they feel are innocuous comments online. They don't know that the FTC is regulating a lot of that stuff, uh, in, in my mind, uh, a lot more than they, they believe. Do, do you see that as a common problem? People don't really understand some of the, the reach of the FTC at this point? It's, it's a huge problem especially in this realm of, um, of startups where people are coming in to um, various marketplaces, whether it's like an online marketplace like Amazon or just generally out there selling on the internet, not having much business experience, maybe not having um, any mentors. You have um, things where people were just, situations where people were just copying what they're seeing others doing out there without realizing that certain things uh, are off limits under FTC guidelines and rules and regulations. I mean, as an example, the endorsement regulation. That's the big one, and I, I bring it up because it's very relevant for people selling online, definitely um, Amazon. Uh, a lot of people don't know that um, if you give something to someone, uh, a free product, for example, and, and they don't disclose that uh, in a review, that's a violation of the endorsement regulation. So, and there are all these different ways that that endorsement regulation and covers testimonials can be violated. Uh, and it's, and um, it's unfortunate, but I've seen some people get hit by the FTC with, with, with what can be viewed as a fairly aggressive lawsuit. And, and it's disappointing because there's so much non-compliance out there. It's extremely frustrating where someone feels like they're doing just what everyone else is doing, but then they're the ones that, gets, that get picked, <laughs> chosen by the FTC to be the example. Yeah, that unlucky uh, example. Uh, so I definitely, we're gonna dive into some of this FTC and the endorsement one is one of the ones that I think is most overlooked. A lot of people just simply don't know that it exists, which, uh, you know, uh, what do they say? Ignorance is not an excuse uh, or something along that line. You, it doesn't mean you have to know the law, you just have to comply with the law. It's so, not a defense. It, yeah, it's it, not a defense. Ignorance is not a defense. It, every now and then it may play in a little bit, but it's sort of after the fact in terms of mitigation. So on these issues, you're right. It is not a defense. Yeah, and I think, you know, every e-commerce person on the planet has probably been guilty in one form or another of violating that uh, endorsement clause or, or that endorsement rule, just to be clear, and myself included uh, along the way. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the, the health and beauty um, kind of claims that are out there. We're going to talk about some of the, the normal Amazon uh, situations where you're kind of called in to help out and so much more. Uh, but we're going to do that right after this break. Empower. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empowery is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Okay, awesomers, we're back again. I've got uh, Carl Cronenberger with me today, and we are talking about 
all kinds of legal things. And, you know, I want to just kind of uh, get in our time machine, Carl, and go back. We probably started interfacing, I, I want to say, in the mid 2000s, uh, maybe 2003, 4, 5, something like that. Do you think that's about right? I think it's about right. Uh, it, it's, it's been a while. Um, uh, you know, you know we, we started working actually on, on trademark matters. That's how we got yeah. our, our, our start to, uh, together. And um, uh, I think it, I was, uh, I think it was maybe three, four years after I, I started this firm. And I uh, had yeah, great experience uh, working with you back then. Yeah, it was definitely. So uh, what I remember especially, and it really spoke to me, and I think it still is just as, as a salient uh, today as it was back you know, 15 years ago-ish, uh, that you guys specialize in internet stuff, right? And we were struggling with cyber squatting. We were struggling with you know, trademark related things because we had a fairly uh, successful company that was getting a lot of attention. So people would go cyber squat, you know, with typos and domain names and all kinds of different things. And it was just kind of like a whack-a-mole situation. But you helped bring order from chaos, as I like to say. And we also had a very complex litigation that you were able to help with that crossed borders between Washington and California. Just really, really great experience. And so for all these years, I always kind of think of Carl and his firm and his team as a really great resource for you know, anything that they specialize in, right? We don't go to Carl and say, hey, we're doing some maritime law and we want to, you know, put in a, a weather station. That's uh, probably not his specialty. But anything internet, we kind of start with Carl's firm and, and see uh, how they can help us. So really great history. I appreciate everything you've done for us. Uh, it, in fact, he helped us win a, a pretty significant litigation. Uh, I always sum up that story where I say, uh, although it didn't finally go to court, we went to... Um, mitigation or what do they call mediation. that mediation yeah. thank you we went to mediation and you know they kind of bring both parties into the uh room and they you know they get both guys and they basically say hey you guys are both full of crap uh you know you're, nobody's getting nothing and then they split into parties and the the mediator came in and said hey listen i've read the thing i think you guys are completely screwed this, he's talking to us and i've already talked to them they say if you give them a hundred grand uh they'll walk away right now uh and we'll just call this thing a day and our response was something like, uh, okay, well, uh, we hear what you're saying. Uh, we disagree. Our counteroffer is give us $6 million and 50% of the company. And, uh, and that's the, the fun began, and it was a long day. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, I think we came far closer to our side than they did there and theirs. Don't you recall? I, I think so. I think yeah. so. It's a very fun, uh, fun, but not fun, actually, but it's fun to look back at it and just go, hey, score one for the, uh, the good guys. Uh, of course, the other guys probably disagree, but say la vie. So, Carl, let's let's just talk about you know how you got started and what made you go down the path of of law. Um, you know, obviously you had to go to university. I hear that's what lawyers do. Tell us about that. Well, I went to Notre Dame, and I was in something called ROTC, uh, Army ROTC, and that's how I uh, I paid for college. And I. Um, when I graduated, I decided instead of going in as a platoon leader, I would uh, go to law school. It was re really either medical school or law school or, or, or be a platoon leader. And um, um, I never really took any science classes, so it was really one choice. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that, that's the interesting sort of story how I decided to go into law, but it was, um, it was a great experience because I went into the Army after law school just fantastic years of my life where uh, I got to, to, to live overseas. I got to, to live in different parts of the country. And I tried a lot of cases. Um, I did all criminal law. And when I was within the Army, I got assigned to the U.S. Attorney's Office, actually in Seattle, when I was there at Fort Lewis, and uh, did some trials there. And um, it, uh, again, it, it, um, it's just this, this great foundation for any lawyer, uh, especially lawyers that like to litigate. So uh, when, I, when I was in the Army, I had a great interest in tech, and especially when I was in Korea, because back then it was really expensive to, to call home. So and the internet was just arriving, and I, I downloaded something called Mosaic, uh, um, which was this web browser, and I remember the very first uh, website I went to, which was CNN, and I remember 
O.J. Simpson slur his picture slowly loading onto that computer screen as my first first web page. Uh, I think it was back in 1990, uh, late 94. Um, and uh, and since then, I, I I just had a big focus on tech. I I did um, a lot of what I've learned is is sort of self-taught. I learned some basic uh, uh, codings when I was in the army just for fun. And I ran certain things for the JAG course, some technology efforts, mostly in the form of automation uh, in, uh, within the JAG Corps. And then when I got out of the army, I wanted to do something that was tech related because just it was my personal interest. So I started a company with my two brothers which uh, involved the distribution of media, mostly animation for kids on TV and, and internet, mostly internet. And I learned a lot about tech and internet and um, various types of licensing deals and dealing with ad networks and internet advertising. Um, and then I sold that company and I, I worked, had to work for two years as the general counsel of the company that bought it, which was this digital media holding company where I, I did the work for all these other digital media companies. And then- uh, how, how did you like that general counsel spot, just out of curiosity? A lot of people when they, you know, entrepreneurs particularly, when they exit a company and they're bound to kind of uh, hold on to some sort of retention uh, concept, uh, in your case, a couple of years, um, th there's varying experiences. How was your experience as general counsel there? It was pretty good. Um, I, um, it was good because I had my work uh, cut out for me uh, and I had a lot of pressure on me but it wasn't the sort of wasn't necessarily the sort of a uh, good sort of pressure dealing with growth uh, that that some others had it was more um, um, getting deals done um, various acquisitions that the company was doing and uh, uh, I enjoyed it because uh, again even you know back then this was 2001 um, uh, certain things were, were still fairly new, uh, so there are a lot of unique issues to deal with in acquisitions when we were acquiring different companies. And um, so I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it really it helped create this foundation for me because I had a litigation foundation and then running this digital media company and then counseling um, all these companies that were acquiring. That was just a great foundation for need to start the law firm, which is what I did once I finished up that two years. Gotcha. So you actually uh, hung out your own shingle once you finished your general counsel. And that was, of course, that times in with uh, the timeline we reflected on earlier, where you, you had been just started out for a couple of years and, and I ended up finding you. Um, and of course, you know, Carl's firm has done so many different types of things over the years that have, have crossed a, a number of things, all, all tech focused. But some of the things that I think uh, people don't realize are uh, not just the FTC stuff we talked about earlier, but like the, the usage of certain words as it relates to health uh, or beauty products. Can you talk about that just for a minute, just to uh, you know, talk about some of the common problems that people face there? Uh, sure. I, I think the, the most important ones are in the realm of just the marketing statements, false statements used. Um, in um, whether it's various landing pages off Amazon or, or if it's on Amazon, it's in the description and the bullet points. Um, uh, I, I think that um, some of it is just, is, is just very basic. It, um, there, there, are, um, there are often claims that people make about what a product can do or what a product contains that are just, that are false. Um, I think one that is you know, sort of concerning is the use of the word organic or natural. Those are the big ones, especially within Amazon. There are a lot of people out there that are just, just using those phrases without thinking much about it. Those can give rise to significant liability. I think in the, in the Amazon realm, it's been more civil liability where there, there are attorneys out there that are uh, threatening or even launching class action lawsuits uh, over the word natural or over the word organic. Uh, off Amazon, there's um, there just a lot of different things that people say that can give rise to liability. 
Um, uh, the before and after pictures is a big one. Where there's a lot of atrocious things going on where people are just are, are making up things. They're they're using Photoshop and or getting before and afters for people working with from some other product. They never even use their product. Uh, that gets us into this realm of of testimonials um, because off Amazon, it um, it's I think it's pretty risky, especially with off of beauty products, to have fake testimonials um, or um, testimonials where this material connection with the company is not disclosed. That material connection being, I got a free product, or I'm related to the owner. Uh, I, a lot of, I think that, as you, as you mentioned, Steve, a lot of people have these experiences, especially when starting, let's say, a, a new product in Amazon. They've got some friends and family that buy the product and they do reviews. And, and uh, uh, I mean, I think it's technically violation of the statute, but, but I, it, 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 it's, um, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's the worst violation in the world. I think when you start looking at on Amazon, where it's not just four or five reviews, but you've got hundreds and hundreds of reviews and there's schemes that people use to pay people uh, a refund them for the product or that sort of thing. That's where you sort of, you cross the line, especially in, in Amazon. Um, so as I said, you've got this, this endorsement regulation, which pervades all the way throughout these, these e-commerce and Amazon stores, but then you also have these issues dealing with false claims, claims about what the product, um, can do, and um, I, I can go into that a little bit more uh, if you want. I, I, th I think what, when it comes to health and beauty products, people are coming up with their marketing claims. They, there needs to be some, obviously some good faith basis in fact. If it, if it deals with some uh, medical issue about what this product can do um, for someone in a, in a medical or health way, there needs to be some substantiation in, uh, in peer-reviewed uh, medical studies. So uh, we, we often help people gather that documentation when we will help do a review of these marketing claims. We'll assess what the substantiation is um, to determine whether or not these companies are on, are, are on uh, firm footing. Uh, but often they're just, it's ignored and, and their statements about this will you could lose this much weight <laughs> lose you know lose a pound a week or or 10 pounds a month or or other uh, <clears throat> other marketing claims about what something will do for your body or your skin or your life in some way yeah so this is a very important point and one thing that i want Oscars out there to take particular note of so first of all if you're in the health and beauty and that you've had a marketing epiphany about all the great benefits that this product will offer whether you use the words natural or organic or pure, any of these types of things, there's, there's regulations around these things and how they're to be marketed. Um, and this is a, you know, under the guise of consumer protection. And there's arguments that I would generally support this uh, you know, in, in trying to get people to be honest and forthright about their, their claims. So my point or what I recommend that people do is if they're in that space, they should have somebody who's knowledgeable and who understands the law do that review. And you kind of uh, alluded to this uh, slightly earlier, but uh, you know, I regularly have people call me and they say, Hey, I've got this problem or, you know, uh, I've got this, um, you know, troll type of attorney who's just sending out, uh, you know, uh, class action kind of form letters, uh, basically threatening to sue anybody who's ever, you know, uh, sneezed the word organic. Uh, or pure or natural or any of the other uh, usual suspects. And so they call me and they're like, hey, I don't know what to do. And I'm always like, first of all, make sure you get somebody like Carl's firm to review the situation. Make sure you understand where you, you stand. And, you know, the best advice is be proactive before you have the problem. How about do the review and try to make sure that you're, you're doing everything that you can that maximizes your marketing opportunity without increasing uh, liability based on violation of rules that you may not know exist. So it, can you talk about how that proactive part of the equation works where people come to you and get their, you know, get their house in order ahead of time? The, the timing is so important. Not, and this is a common scenario I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about where um, people will develop a product and they, um, 
Uh, they're developing some of the marketing copies so they're writing down in some sort of document which they're going to hand over to a designer to create a box and to create a label. Uh, they'll also use that to create the, the listing on Amazon or maybe a landing page on a website. And uh, maybe they'll use the word natural or organic or some other claim regarding uh, people's health. And without that much thought in it into being put into it because at that point they're running sort of fast and uh, there there's there's excitement about a new product and there's a lot of opportunity out there and they're thinking oh we can always change things later let's just get things going go 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 um, we're, we're without much focus on legal issues so um, maybe there's an initial run of five thousand you know boxes and, and labels and and uh, inventory is shipped out to various warehouses or the Amazon. And uh, then there starts to be some growth. And then they start to realize that, yeah, maybe, let's maybe, let's go look at this. You know, I didn't really put that much thought into what's on those labels. And then maybe they get a letter from somebody, uh, some attorney that says, there's huge liability here. You need to settle with us or we're gonna file this class action lawsuit. And then there's these really difficult decisions to make because you have, Maybe you've got 20,000 units that are, that are sitting in a warehouse uh, it, and uh, you haven't even done the, the research you need to do to figure out how you can change these marketing statements. So it's a horrible situation because that's, you know, if you're going to pull those products back, you have to figure out what it's going to cost to, to get their shit back to you. How can you change labels, and <laughs> change boxes? It's, it's, and, 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 and if it's a small amount of inventory, maybe it's, maybe it's fine. But uh, it it's always seems to be pretty painful for, for the business owner. And then you gotta deal with the lawyer who's, who's making these demands, uh, saying he's, he's gonna sue you. You gotta figure out, do, you know, do I ignore this, this guy and just let him, let him file something or do I negotiate? And then it's a whole, you know, a bunch of money that I'm gonna have to pay uh, on top of the money I have to pay to change my labeling. So the, the, this is an example of how timing is so important. Yeah, so I, I just can't reiterate enough that if you're in that health and beauty space, be proactive uh, in terms of compliance. So I'm a big fan of, you know, go quick, launch fast, and, and go, go, go. But in certain categories, and that includes health and beauty, probably includes toys and other things that are heavily regulated, heavily monitored for compliance and so forth, you really have to check off some of the basic buttons. And if you don't know those buttons, you need to pump the brakes a little bit and back up and get it right because every one of those packages that Carl talked about, those are evidence against you later if they're done wrong. And believe me, those the, the opposing attorneys, uh, particularly the ones that are taking kind of uh, proactive action against people, you know, they're, they're, that's their business. They're into uh, beating down guys on Amazon or online that are using these words improperly. They're buying examples and gathering evidence, and that will be something that uh, – you know, cost you money to defend, cost you money to settle, and cost you money to fix. And it can have large ramifications for you in terms of your business, your valuation, and, and any potential exit as well. So, so proactivity is uh, the rule of the day for that. Uh, Carl, let me ask you this. Uh, at, you know, you've been doing kind of uh, internet-related uh, legal stuff for so many years. Has there, has there been a big lesson that you've noticed in your journey so far? A anything kind of universal that it's like, hey, if I could tell entrepreneurs or business people this particular lesson, it would be helpful for them and, and ideally for you in the future. Wow. I guess there's a lot of things I'd want to say. I think the most important thing, the most basic thing is to have some amount of formality at the very beginning, uh, especially if you've got um, partners. Um, so you've got issues with your partners and you've got issues with, with the intellectual property of your business. With your partners, um, it can be great or it can be a complete nightmare if things aren't in writing. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and there are some shortcuts that, w that we've put together for people that just don't have time to put together the more complex corporate documents, but they want something in place with a partner or multiple partners moving forward. But that's just so important to get that uh, in place. And then the other area of formality, I think, would be uh, with 
with trademarks and copyrights, especially on online marketplaces where so much uh, depends on the strength of your intellectual property, especially when your brand starts to grow. You need to be able to protect yourself. You need to be able to take aggressive act, um, action in that realm um, to, uh, again, protect yourself and go after others who are threatening your brand. If you don't take early action to firm up your intellectual property, especially your trademarks, then uh, when you really need to take action, it could take months to get things in line. For example, it takes a while to get a trademark registered. Uh, often it takes six months before it goes into publication and, and then you get the publication period. So um, one thing we've been doing recently, we've been filing petitions to expedite, which has been um, fairly successful for us. We've been able to shorten that that six month period, but still people need to start early and do the basic things like brand enrollment uh, at Amazon uh, or uh, again, they, um, it's going to, it's sort of a mess later. Yeah. So this is uh, some really great uh, gold nuggets as they like to say that this is what the millennials say, hashtag millennial there. Uh, we're dropping gold nuggets over here. The, the first I want to just reinforce is this idea that when you begin in business, particularly if you have partners, this is the time, during the honeymoon period to write stuff down. Hey, uh, if you want to buy me out or I want to buy you out, what are the terms of that? How are we going to value the company? Kind of getting that, that basic stuff down and, and any governance and, and individual responsibilities, all that should be written down because the honeymoon doesn't last forever. And I've had wonderful partnerships with, with folks and I've had stuff that went sideways. And at the end of the day, it's the, the legal documents and the, the pieces of paper that everybody can rely on. When we've had it and it was tight, it, it really was more or less amicable, even if there was strife in the relationship. When we didn't have it, that's when trouble happens. And, you know, it's kind of like a, a, an ugly divorce, right? Everybody's hiring lawyers and it just gets ugly. So that reinforcement of getting your ducks in a row and, and adding formalities, you called it early on, very, very good advice. The other thing, I just can't stress this enough. When you, when you really are putting a brand together and you expect this thing to be something that is truly important to you, take the time to get your trademark uh, organized and, and get your ducks in a row. And by all means, please hire a professional. People don't realize, yes, you can go to the trademark office and you can pay the money and you can write things down on a piece of paper and send it in. But the scrutiny that the trademark office has, the enforceability, just the, the, the preliminary search to see if it's even gonna be accepted anyway, all of that people underestimate. And having watched Carl and his team work you know, for a very, very long time, they add so much experience and value that is far greater than the little Scooby snack they charge in terms of a fee. So I highly recommend, whether you choose Carl's firm, which is who I like to use, or somebody else, just did, get it right. Get a professional to help you. Otherwise, what you have often is just a piece of paper, not that enforceable. Do you, do you think that general principle is, is fair to say, Carl, even though it may be mildly self-serving? I think I think so. I think that um, it is helpful uh, to get that initial advice because um, you know sometimes there are some mis mistakes that are made in some of those early filings. Uh, I think the most important thing is just is to do it. You, you do have common law protection, and, and it, w w outside of Amazon, I think the common law protection is a lot more important, a lot more meaningful. Some people never register trademarks if you know when they're when they're out there outside of Amazon and we filed many cases for for companies that just that don't have registered marks but th there are there are some disadvantages for those those companies you get better there are certain advantages regarding constructive notice you can it's it's harder for some people to say that they didn't know about your mark if you've registered it um, but then once you get into Amazon, it's uh, it's so much more important because uh, Am Amazon these days is um, uh, uh, brands for, from Amazon's perspective uh, are just not as as important uh, to to, uh, to to them. It, it's um, uh, and uh, there's such a focus. With Amazon, with all, with just selling these sort of items, these widgets, and so I think from their perspective, it's not as important. From the seller perspective, it's everything, especially when you've got uh, 
factories that are producing similar products for, for multiple people that are all selling on Amazon. How do, you, how do you set yourself apart, especially when, you, when you've got a situation with Amazon where they don't care that much about sellers? It's all focused on consumers. So you need to do everything you possibly can to, to set those protections up for you as a seller early on in Amazon. Yeah, I quite agree. When we come back after this next break, we're going to talk a little bit about my philosophy of having a good legal defense, but also having a good legal offense, uh, as well as some of the typical Amazon kind of copy relate problem, copy related problems that Carl and I have seen along the way. And we'll be right back after this. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. Okay, we're back again, everybody. And uh, Carl Cronenberger is uh, schooling us about uh, all things legal, uh, particularly as it relates to internet and trademarks and, and so forth. And, you know, as much as uh, people uh, would rather, you know, kind of just go count the money and see how many sales they've made today, this is one of those times where I just remind people they need to eat their vegetables, right? You, you got to be able to understand some of the, the, the laws and compliance and frameworks that exist out there both for the, the government side of it, the federal government being the FTC and things like that, but also the marketplaces and how they have decided to enforce or require you to fall in line with things. Uh, for example, Amazon now for the brand registry program requires you to have a trademark if you want any sort of, uh, I'll put protection in quote marks there, because they, they imply that if you have a brand registry that you will have less um, competition on your listing and as Carl talked about before the last break, Amazon doesn't really focus on pr trying to protect sellers. They want the lowest price for consumers. So the more people that sell that item, the better in Amazon's perspective. And fair enough, that's their marketplace uh, concept. As a seller, however, we look at it and say, if they were selling my authentic stuff, I wouldn't have much to say about it. But mostly it's guys jumping on my listing selling counterfeit stuff, which is a big problem. Have you seen that sort of thing happen, Carl? Uh, you know, fake stuff being sold under people's listings? Yes, I mean, it's, it's a crisis, uh, in, in my opinion. And um, for, for we've had, we've, this has always been a big issue for us, this ASIN hijacking or just you know, straight up um, counterfeiting. In fact, this is, I'm, I'm testifying as an expert in federal court in Houston on this issue of, of ASIN hijacking. Uh, so, uh, I think from the seller perspective, the best advice is to get your IP in line as early as possible. Obviously, register trademark. I think also think it's helpful to have to file copyright registrations on your product packaging. And uh, if you're in a situation where people are jumping on your listing, um, I think the first thing to do often is to make a test buy to see what that is. Because you can have a situation where they're copying your logo and your product packaging, but it's, it's the more pure form of counterfeiting. And if that's the case, you take before and after pic, uh, photos. And we've been pretty successful in getting those, those companies shut down pretty quickly. If you've got a situation where the product that's shipped doesn't have any uh, any logos on it, but the product is very similar to your product, then you get into um, uh, a sticky situation. But I still believe that you've got trademark infringement and, 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 and counterfeiting there because people are making a decision to buy based on the marks in that product listing, which are your marks, uh, which is your brand. So we still uh, you know, make both trademark and counterfeiting arguments based on those those facts there are many different flavors of, of, of counterfeiting and ASIN hijacking. But the point is uh, having the registered mark is important. It's also important to have a track record of enforcing your intellectual property within Amazon because if you get to a point where you are 
sending Amazon um, a request to disable certain sellers uh, on a weekly or daily basis, you may be in a position to get Amazon to restrict all sales on that ASIN to just uh, your company and those you approve. Uh, some people call this brand gating. It's a phrase I really don't like because I feel like it's sort of made up by people outside of Amazon, I believe. I don't, I don't think Amazon created that. Correct me if I'm, I'm, if I'm wrong. It's also extremely difficult to get. It's, 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 I think it's easier to get than it used to be. I think a lot of the big, big brands are, uh, have restrictions and we've been able to get restrictions after a history of counterfeiting. I know there are people out there that are, that are selling these fixed fee packages will get you brain gated. I'm pretty skeptical of those. <laughs> Uh, and I, I guess I won't, I won't comment too much on them. I just say I'm skeptical about them. But our experience is there's got to be a reason, uh, a compelling reason that's usually um, a lot of counterfeiting um, and other unlawful conduct on that ASIN by these third parties. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, the, 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 the creativity that these guys come up with, right? It, it's always... Uh, it, it, if it wasn't so destructive, it's almost magical to watch how creative these hijackers and guys are because they, they come up with all kinds of new tactics. So when they get shut down on the seller listings, often uh, for, for a certain period of time, maybe in the last 12, 18 months, they would then use Vendor Express and send the product in. As, as a vendor, and then Amazon's the one selling you the counterfeit items, which is even harder to get uh, shut down at times. And then now that Vendor Express has gone away, we've seen people actually have Vendor Central accounts sending in fake stuff uh, with some of our brands and some of my colleagues' brands. So it is, I, I don't know where brand gating came from, by the way, as a little side note on the origin story. Uh, I, I don't know of a, of a better word for it at the moment, but I can say this, it's, you know, it's a really important thing to try to get your brand into whatever moat that you want to think of it as. And there are mechanisms within Amazon to allow that. They just don't want to do it wholesale because that removes that uh, competition for the listing concept that they have been um, really founded on, right? Amazon has kind of three founding pillars. Uh, one of them is low price and that's driven by, you know, marketplace, uh, having lots of people in the marketplace to drive down that price. Another one is selection and the other one is service, right? So as, as anybody looks at Amazon, they can always assume that Amazon is looking through the lens of those three things. So when you say, hey, this brand is mine, I exclusively distribute it around the world, only you know, myself, uh, uh, only my company, my team can sell you this product uh, with the approved and authentic stuff. Amazon's kind of like, hey, this other guy says he's got it, that's good enough for us. And so by having that history, as Carl talked about, of documenting and and creating you know kind of cases and and uh, track record, you can I think leverage that to to tell Amazon, you know if you don't start paying attention to Amazon, pretty soon it's going to be your liability. I don't know if that's it's ever gotten to that level, but boy, I'd like to see you know a, a little bit of culpability on the part of Amazon for knowingly allowing some of this stuff to happen. Well, another strategy is just to look at the Amazon policy and to build your case based on that policy. So if, if someone is gonna sell a product on your ASIN, it ha, um, the, the description has to accurately describe that product. And there, there are examples that Amazon gives in its, pol in its um, policy. You know, you, it should be the same uh, manufacturer, for example. And, and if so it, it should be the same UPC code. So if, just with those two things, if you got a different UPC code and a different manufacturer, I think it should be fairly clear to Amazon that person needs to be kicked off immediately, violated the policy. Uh, so that's that's been that's been our methodology. It's I, I certainly I love that simple, easy approach, which is to us quite obvious as sellers, particularly brand sellers that are trying to protect ourselves. Uh, Carl, can you talk about just kind of the the relationship that you have? Uh, and your firm has uh, kind of built with Amazon, uh, whether it's a relationship or just a, a understanding and knowledge about each other. I mean, you deal with Amazon all the time. How does that look in real life? Well, it, it is, it's definitely adversarial. We've never represented Amazon, um, but we, we um, were 
we ha we uh, we do handle arbitrations against them. I feel like it's it's adversarial, but it's very cordial, very professional. We're very selective about the cases that we take. Um, we get we're just inundated with leads, people from with with problems on Amazon, and they want our help. But there's a lot of sketchy stuff going on out there. We're very selective. Feel like we've got a reputation to uphold. Uh, we also uh, often go through the normal channels of Amazon. I mean, we do have relationships with you know a bunch of attorneys there, and eventually things they can get escalated to those attorneys. But this is one thing that I, I just want to emphasize. It's I think it is important to go through those the correct channels, the, the initial channels first. That 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 email <laughs> that 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 that, um, that you send complaints to. Start with those. Yes, it's they're going to be this, these people on the front line. They may not have that much experience, but uh, I think our, our experience has been a, it's been a lot more effective, and we do able to get quicker results by going that route as opposed to immediately going to their in-house counsel. Um, that's just our strategy, um, and uh, I, I want to—I I should emphasize that because some people think that we have some special relationships um, with Amazon. And I guess we do, but we generally don't um, rely upon those for initial correspondence. We rely upon very clear, succinct, um, simple arguments to get our point across very quickly uh, on our letterhead that hopefully they've seen before. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I do want to kind of reinforce this point that you know, uh, we shouldn't feel ourselves get triggered when we have a situation and kind of hit the uh, nuke option right off the bat. Uh, working the, the system and kind of cooperating with Amazon with their own uh, system is fine as long as that, you know, kind of works out. And then if it doesn't, you keep following the system until it is escalated to whatever level it needs to be to be resolved. But, you know, I have people, because I, I'm, um, I don't know, I have a bunch of relationships at Amazon with really great people. They're trying to help sellers. They, you know, many of these people really do have genuine um, empathy for sellers out there. And they realize that the, the behemoth that is Amazon is kind of like a machine. And the machine is often just, just whacking guys left and right is running over them as you know, in many cases inadvertently. So uh, as I have told Amazon, this, this idea that they are trying to, you know, drag the net through the water to catch the bad smelly fish that are cheating and, and, doing all the bad stuff, all the black hat stuff is great. We, we support that. All, all honest sellers should support that. The problem is the dolphins, that's us. We get caught up in that net too often and, you know, stop, stop getting the dolphins. That's what I want to tell Amazon. But even when people call me and they say, Hey, I've got this problem. I'm not going to generally call Amazon directly or, or make an introduction to Amazon directly on that because they need to work the system. We'll, we'll burn through any resource that really has the empathy and understanding and, and desire to help us if we just simply call you know them every time it just it won't work it's not sustainable so I do appreciate the fact that you know we should use the system and work the system as best we can so Carl when when you think about you know this concept of you know everything from hijacking what, what let's talk about listing suspensions and things like that have, have you come across where a listing or an account has been suspended and had to kind of interface with that at all that's probably um, the bulk of the work that we do is dealing with that. And um, a good amount of it is this another crisis I see where people are making intellectual property claims from free email addresses or, or, or even email addresses from free services in China. One email to Amazon brings down a listing. It's, it's the most frustrating thing um, that, I've seen in quite some time, and I, we've seen waves of it. I saw you know, a wave maybe six months ago, and I thought it got better, but we've been seeing a lot more of it these days. So we're helping people respond um, to Amazon, uh, to Amazon um, because Amazon usually says, work it out with the intellectual property owner. But this is just some random Yahoo address. Who is this person? They're not responding to me. So um, that, that's, that is a big problem, and we've generally been able to get on top of that. I think the problem is it doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen often the same day, and every day that goes by, there's, um, there's important revenue that's, that's lost 
And then there's also momentum if you're if your listing is down for a while and then it's back up, um, momentum that's lost there. So that's something that is a great concern of ours. Um, we we do deal with account suspensions from time to time. Frankly, we're pretty selective with what clients we take on with, with um, account suspensions because a lot of times the account suspensions are for good reason. <laughs> yeah, that's, let's take a minute, everybody, and remember that uh, you know you go take a poll at the prison. Everybody there's innocent, right? And I've heard a lot of sellers come to me and they're like, "Hey, I didn't do nothing, right?" And uh, then you go, "Yeah, but didn't you send out you know ten thousand uh, review requests or review reimbursements or whatever?" And they're like, "Well, yeah, I did that, but uh, you know what, what's that, right?" So let, let's remember that there is, should be a level of enforcement that is reasonable, and as long as it's consistent and fair then we should have no problem with it because that's the only way to regulate something. So I, that's I, a very good, very good example with, with the reviews. Just a few weeks ago, we had this person who had 7,800 reviews that she had obtained on, on her product that she just launched about a, uh, um, about a month before. Um, and uh, it was all done through various Facebook groups where people would buy it and be reimbursed through PayPal afterward. Just complete, you know, clear, egregious violation of the Amazon rules, obviously a violation of FTC regulations. And the person, you know, calls us and, and asks if we can help her um, get her account. Actually, account wasn't suspended. They just removed all the reviews. I think her account probably will be suspended. And uh, we, 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 uh, we passed on that. Um, so, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, if, if that person ever got representation. I think that there's certain lines that, that people with Amazon um, businesses just sh shouldn't cross. I mean, that, they should not get involved in that egregious behavior. It can backfire big time on Amazon, but there's also um, just the federal law out there that prohibits it. Yeah, it is, you know, particularly as it relates to reviews, this is where that testimonial uh, requirement kicks in. It, there's so much that you can do that's just pure wrong, right? And the, the reality for me is that everybody understood, they, they kind of uh, three, four years ago said, maybe it's even five, six years ago now, they said, gosh, if we get a lot of reviews and the reviews are, you know, keep us at that four and a half star level or above, our conversion rate goes off the charts. You know, they, they could see it. And they, then they say, well, gosh, uh, solve for X, how do I get more reviews? Well, let's let's just pay people for reviews, right? It just seems so obvious. Uh, and then, of course, all these review services started coming out. And then, when you actually see as a company, and you see here's a here's a company, and they just sell reviews. That's all they sell. That sounds perfectly uh, uh, like a solution for you. And you're like, hey, I'm you know signing up. But the the fact that Amazon A hates that, and there's a review purge happening right now in the summer of 2018. That is, that is catastrophic. And I personally believe there's a bunch of false positives in their algorithm. Um, I've seen you know, people that I know are basically very passive business owners. They, they do almost nothing with their, uh, their listings or products or active kind of uh, review uh, enhancement type of techniques. And they, you know, they've watched you know, 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 reviews just disappear. So they're, they're, I do think that those false positives, the dolphins are still getting caught in the net. But by and large, if we try to avoid those hacks, which are short-term tactics that will never work long-term, Amazon will always hammer that out, then I think it's uh, easier to, to carry on with business. And as Carl said, you know, a discerning law firm is not even going to want to represent somebody that has probably been in violation of the rules to begin with. Uh, Carl, have you ever faced a situation where you know, somebody has had – maybe you haven't uh, encountered this, but somebody's had like legitimate reviews dis disappear on them? Um, well, in this exact, this summer, I, we, we have had some clients that have, have that have lost some reviews and um, we have, well, we, we have often gone to Amazon regarding bad reviews by competitors, um, but this is sort of a new thing where we're going and asking for good reviews to be reinstated. And we've made some attempts, but we don't have enough, I don't have enough data there to, to tell you how successful we have been because it's still happening right now. Um, yeah, it is so live. This is, this is just, it's fairly new for us. 
Yeah, this, you know, the frontier keeps changing. This is probably why Carl likes uh, the internet kind of space so much, right? Because it's quite dynamic. Mm -hmm. Things are always changing, you know, where cyber squatting was a giant problem at one period of time. And then the next thing is, you know, some other, uh, you know, DCMA takedowns uh, or DMCA, digital money. DMCA. Yeah. How often are you dealing with DMCA takedowns at this stage? If we can make them, we will, we will absolutely make them because it is the quickest way to get something down. And that's why we want people to do test buys because if, if someone is using your product packaging, that's your copyright. And if you have a, a registration for that copyright, it makes the argument a lot stronger for Amazon. So if we can make it, we absolutely do. And you get really quick action from Amazon out there. Yeah, I think that's uh, an important one. And can you just give us the, the 30 or 60 second summary of what uh, DMCA is? Uh, for those who don't understand, uh, I know that's a whole legislation and not a 60 second blurb, but just ha what it is real quick and what a DMCA, a DMCA takedown is. Well, DMCA stands for Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it gives immunity to ISPs um, um, for, from copyright infringement. Um, that arises um, from the actions of their their customers if the ISP follows the rules. And in this context, Amazon is going to be considered an ISP or service provider under the DMCA. So if you if if someone is infringing on your copyrights on Amazon, under the statute, you can give Amazon notice that there's this infringement going on and you can and it's a request for it to be taken down. Uh, Amazon um, has to follow the statute, and if it's a properly formatted request, they need they will take that content down. Uh, now that means they're going to be immune from liability. Now the supposed infringer has the ability to do what's called a counter notice, and if you do that counter notice, then Amazon can put that content back up and in, in not be liable for it. Uh, so the way it works with Amazon, you can do formal DMCA notices, but the way they formatted their form, um, their online form, it is essentially a DMCA takedown notice because it uses the same language as, uh, as the statute. So uh, I think it's, it's a lot more effective than some sort of trademark demand because it's the separate statutory scheme and also it's pretty clear if, if we if, if it, it if um, we have a strong case we have we have um, side-by-side -side photos that show that obviously they're copying it and, and it's sort of a cheap reproduction and we and we show Amazon um, that copyright infringement that's pretty effective how about the you know, the fact that people will often steal somebody's images, you know, we've gone to the trouble of having images professionally taken. Uh, occasionally they'll edit them or flip them or, you know, reduce them in size in some way. But when, if somebody takes the pictures, I know they have kind of the common law protection, but if they take the extra step of filing for copyright registration on those pictures or even their, their title or their copy, does that allow them to use the DMCA to, uh, you know, get people off their listing or to prevent that people from selling against them? You do not need a copyright registration in order to, in order to make a demand under the DMCA. Oh. But so uh, if you have one, I think it's stronger because the threat is more real to the service provider, but you don't need one. If you're going to sue anybody later uh, for copyright infringement, you need a, a registered copyright before you file your lawsuit. And... If you if you've got uh, obtained a registration, and the infringement happens after you obtained the registration, that means you can seek what's called statutory damages of uh, up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for intentional infringement, and you have the right to re request attorney's fees. You cannot get statutory damages or attorney's fees if you see the infringement and then you decide to register your copyright. So that's why if you've got a, a popular product, something you're making a lot of money from, it's sort of a no-brainer to get copyright uh, registrations on uh, all your photos and all your product packaging. This is uh, a perfect segue into my philosophy that having a good legal defense 
is just as important of having a good legal offense, just as important. So the, the legal defense side of the equation is what we talked about at the top of the show where we said, you know, get compliant with uh, FTC regulations. And if you're in health and beauty, make sure you're not making claims that are going to be a problem, right? That's, that's getting your defensive wall in order. Uh, but by, in my mind, by setting up a quarterly copyright registration process for your company, uh, assuming you're doing a lot of product development or things are happening on a regular basis, content creation, videos, photos, whatever the case may be, just setting that process up so that you get these registrations on file gives you so much more opportunity as an offensive measure to go out and put the, the kibosh on some of these things because now you have teeth. It's one thing to say, stop doing it or I'll get mad at you, right? That's kind of a common law copyright uh, letter um, versus getting the stop doing this. Uh, by the way, now that you've done it, uh, I'm going to come after you for the, you know, up to the 150 statutory plus attorney's fees. And boy, we've got a bunch of attorneys and they make a ton of money. So good luck uh, to you, right? And that kind of offensive measure can really help set the tone where people will stay away from your listing. People stay away from your, your copyrights and trademarks. We've had many cases of people stealing. You know, I, I remember in one case, we had somebody stole 15,000 images from us. They just scraped our site and they made their own site with all of our images. And of course, we did, you know, DMCA'd them and we had everything registered through Carl's firm. And it was a, a slam dunk. They, they were gone and that was that. It seems like a pain. It seems like extra steps, but you don't know that you need it until you need it. And so I think this is my effort to try to make people aware of these things. Carl, do you have anything to add to that? Am I uh, out of my mind? Am I just one of those crazy uh, litigious people? No, I, I think there's definitely a role for that, that, that sort of aggressive action. There, there's also other things that we've done. Um, and, and I think th this applies to businesses that have gotten to a certain point where they've got some significant revenues. Uh, so if someone is out there falsely advertising, if you've got a unique product and someone is, doesn't have the same product, but they're using a lot of the same marketing, a lot of the same marketing claims, and they're just straight up false statements, uh, and you feel if you could take out one or two people, um, you could, uh, th there's gonna be significantly more revenue you're gonna generate, then, you, you do the math, it, 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 at a certain point, it makes sense to litigate those false advertising claims. Uh, so, it, it, and, and if you've got registered intellectual property, that may uh, come into play as well. Uh, but I, I think it's something that people don't do enough of in the Amazon marketplace um, um, because there's, especially in these, these niche areas where there are not very many, there are not very many players um, uh, but I, I think that there are, like for example, uh, you know, another strategy is if, if you know that, that with a certain, let's say health and beauty product, that a certain company is saying that their product contains a certain level of whether it's vitamin C or whatever, whatever, that, whatever it is, and you know it's not true, you know, we've helped clients buy that product and send it to the lab. And then at that point, you're in a position to sue them. You could sue them or threaten to sue them, to sort of to take them out of the marketplace. And in, and in very high volume, with very high volume products, that makes sense from a financial standpoint. Well, this is really the, the why to me it's important to have both ducks in a row. So it doesn't make sense for us to go, you know, throw shade on somebody and go, hey, you don't have, a, a, you know, enough vitamin C in your product uh, you know, you claim X amount and we to, went to the lab and you don't have it in there if you don't also tell the truth, uh, right? So in the world of truth telling, we should all hold ourselves and others to the same standard. And this is one of those uh, foundational issues for me. If we tell the truth and we do the right thing, our costs, is, they're inherently higher, right? When, when you do the right things, you're putting all the right products, the more expensive stuff goes in. And the way guys shave costs is they, they cut corners, they start cheating the system a little bit. And, you know, uh, sometimes in China, they call it product fade, right? So, you know, it started out as pretty close to what they claimed. And, and over time, it got farther and farther and farther away. Well, that's just simply not fair. And by the way, they're, it's not fair to the customer, most of all, but it's certainly not fair to your business. It's, uh, you know, an unfair trade practice, if you will. And I like, I do not like, I don't stand for that stuff. Now, the first is, I got to have my house in order. I, I'm not throwing stones at somebody else if, if I'm doing the wrong thing. And the second is, if they're unfairly competing, 
and they're misleading customers and they're more or less saying their stuff is as good or better than ours and it's not really, then we should, uh, we should be prepared to, to take it to the street. So uh, I'm, I'm a big advocate of that myself. And it, it doesn't mean we want to spend our lives in court, but it does mean we need to preserve and protect what we're building in terms of equity in our business. Uh, so I appreciate that fact. So Carl, as we, as we come to the end of our uh, time together, I've sure enjoyed it. Uh, I, I just wonder if you have any, any predictions. Uh, pull out your crystal ball and talk about maybe the Amazon space uh, for the future. Uh, you know, we're all, uh, nobody's going to be right about the future, but uh, just on the off chance, uh, what do you got for us? This is tough. I guess this, uh, my, my only comment is, 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 a, is a generalization. Uh, and, and that is, um, there's a certain context where I think um, brand uh, building becomes you know, so much more important. Um, uh, I, I think that there are certain products that are, it's, it's great for, to get started on Amazon, develop sales, and then go offline. But, but uh, I think that there is gonna be this, you know, this change, this movement, especially in certain sectors where more and more is bought online as opposed to offline, for example, and uh, groceries or different consumables. Um, and I think um, because of that, I think brand is more and more uh, important. So from, from my perspective, just when, with me looking at the value of different businesses, and by the way, I do represent a couple funds that, that buy Amazon businesses. So, so looking at these issues quite frequently, what makes an Amazon business valuable? Uh, I think uh, for many reasons, it's that strength of the brand. And there are many ways to build a brand. It's not just your trademark registration. It's building it up in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So I think that is really, really uh, sage wisdom. And, you know, I, I talk about this concept often of equity, right? Sometimes we create intellectual equity where we're learning things and, and nobody can take that away from us. But when we're talking about building equity into our businesses, those things are fluid, right? Equity goes up when we build the brand and we, we've got big customer lists and, and loyal, happy customers leaving us positive organic reviews uh, without uh, you know, any incentivization. That's, that's a brand that's growing. And I think it's, it was even Jeff Bezos who said, you, know, you could tell the, the power of a brand by what people say about the brand when you're not in the room, right? And that's when you have people who are really talking about the brand proactively and they're happy and they're sharing it, making it literally noteworthy that's a real brand and that's going to create equity and i you know the more people kind of direct themselves towards that versus the the arbitrage concepts of just knock off this guy and then knock off that guy and and try to keep the machine running that that's a a treadmill that will never end and and doesn't really have that much equity at the end of it so very very good advice uh carl thank you so much for joining us today it's been a real pleasure and uh, i know it's your time super valuable so thank you on behalf of osmers for giving us that time today Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, it's my pleasure as always. Osmers will be right back after this. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals. This is Parsimony ERP, and we get one question over and over. Can you please tell me exactly what Parsimony does? Well, we'll try, but this is only a 30-second spot, so we're going to have to hurry. Connect to your Seller Central account and pull all the new orders. Enter the orders with all customer data. Enter all of the Amazon fees and charges. Store them at the item level. Generate profit and loss reports at the SKU level. Automatically generate income statements. Handle multiple companies. Handle multiple brands. Handle multiple currencies. Facilitate budgets and forecasts. Store all customer interactions in a sophisticated CRM system. Manage your supply chain. Budget and task management. Maintain an audit log. Hey, you get it. That's parsimony. P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N-Y dot com. Parsimony dot com. We've got that. Well, I bet you didn't see all of those subjects uh, coming up today. Uh, I always have fun talking with Carl. And as you can see, he's not just smart and kind of insightful, but he's creative as well. And this is, this is one of the things that I really enjoy about Carl is that, you know, he doesn't just look at things and, you know, kind of a typical lawyer uh, response to things is no or it depends. Uh, Carl will always give you, you know, his best and most honest advice. And the same goes for the other folks in his firm. I regularly recommend this firm. Uh, again, I have no personal affiliation. This is just somebody that I think is awesomer. The, the team is awesomer. And especially for those involved in the internet world, e-commerce, and particularly in the Amazon space, this is a firm you need to know. And you're lucky that you are here today to hear it. 
So this has been Awesomers.com podcast episode number 35. And again, as I mentioned at the top of the show, all you have to do is go to Awesomers.com slash 35 to find the relevant show notes and details. And by the way, you can go there. You can leave comments about the episode. You can join the mailing list. There's all kinds of other things you can do to kind of stay informed and become a part of the community. We are now 35 days in a row dropping what I think is pretty great content. I hope you agree. And I want to reinforce this idea that you, the listener, listening at this very moment, you and me are talking together, that we have this opportunity to connect. You can go onto Facebook and find Osmers.com page. You can go onto our website at Osmers.com and contribute uh, comments, etc. And of course, uh, I always recommend and, and appreciate when people go and share this online and leave us reviews on iTunes and Google Play and, and the like. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Osmers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again.